Welcome to the Internet Innovation Alliance's Fireside Chat Series. I'm Kim Keenan, co-chair of the Internet Innovation Alliance. And today I'm talking with FCC Commissioner Jeffrey Starks. And we're gonna be talking about, by closing the digital divide, how we can make a difference in systemic inequality. So I feel free to send your questions to the chat box and we'll get them and we'll try to get to them at the end if we have time. But I wanna just do a quick introduction. He needs no introduction, but I'm gonna do a just very brief one anyway, because you deserve it. Um, before his appointment as commissioner, he was deputy attorney general at Justice. He was a leader in the FCC's enforcement bureau. He's practiced at Williams and Connolly. He's clerked on the US Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit. He graduated from Harvard College with high honors and he's a graduate of Yale Law School. He has been a fervent advocate for diversity and employment, getting rid of internet inequality, entrepreneurship, media ownership. He is really focused on how modern communications technology can empower every American. So welcome, Commissioner Starks. Well, thank you so much for that warm introduction. I, I need to have your voice uh, introducing and, and playing in my mind uh, at, 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 wherever I go, actually, not even just in my mind. So thank you for that warm and generous uh, introduction. Anytime. It was easy breezy. You got so many great things. I left a whole lot of things out because we want to jump right into this conversation. And I mean, you have hit the ground running since 2019 when you started as a commissioner and your efforts to close the digital divide, which are near and dear to my heart, um, especially in communities where people have low income, where they're on, you know, reservations or where they're people of color. And you've been successful in raising that awareness, you know, because for so long people just didn't understand. So what do you see as the next step for making broadband affordable for all Americans? Well, uh, it's a great question, Kim. So, so uh, you know, again, honored to be joining you and, uh, and, and our audience here today. And, and I do believe, uh, you know, that raising awareness, heightening the discourse is an essential part of my role. Uh, and so, you know, one of the tremendous powers uh, uh, that a commissioner has that I have is the power to convene. Uh, the power to escalate and elevate a narrative that uh, focuses on hardships, focuses on the vulnerable and how they're facing those and what, how we can drive solutions. And so, uh, you know, I have hosted events from Black Mental Health uh, and its intersection with broadband to the Latinx digital divide to how our small businesses and the future of work is going to perform including for communities of color. Uh, and then of course I've written, you know, a number of pieces on broadband access with civil rights leaders, focusing on how we're going to make sure uh, that black and brown communities get the focus on broadband that they need. And so, you know, uh, to, to, to take a quick step back, you know, I, I believe deeply uh, that now is the time uh, to speak plainly on these issues of equity. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is that there is a disparate uh, economic and racial impact by the digital divide. And so, you know, even now in 2021, communities of color are still by a wide margin, uh, significantly less likely to have that home broadband connection than their counterparts. And so that reverberates throughout work and healthcare and education. And, and of course, you know, pointedly critical government resources. We've seen this play out, of course, uh, with the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines and who's connected and who's not. Uh, and so this is the time, now is the moment uh, to tackle these issues head on. And so, you know, to, 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 to come to your question even, you know, over the last several years, you know, the prior administration, I think, was focused primarily on broadband access to rural communities. Uh, it, you know, uh, I'm a Kansan, uh, and so I totally understand. I believe that the access issue, the rural access issue, warrants attention. But we also need to focus on uh, the adoption issue, especially since nearly three times as many people live in urban, densely populated areas that have not adopted broadband. And so that is uh, most pointedly focusing on the issue of affordability. So, you know, a couple of next steps that I think are going to be essential for us getting um, uh, universal broadband for all. 
you know, step one, we need to make sure that we set up this emergency broadband benefit, get it stood up, uh, and most definitely out to as many eligible households as possible. This is a mission critical program designed to bring connectivity to low income folks that otherwise are having trouble uh, affording the internet that we know that they need. Second, uh, you know, uh, we need to quickly move on the seven billion in E-rate funding that was passed on the Hill. Uh, you know, I think the president is, if he hasn't signed it already, I think he's set to sign it, you know, momentarily-ish. Uh, but we need to make sure that our E-rate program, you know, meets the moment. And then kind of the last thing that I would say is, is, is on my mind frequently here you know, is, uh, again, redounding on that issue of affordability. You know, the Universal Service Fund program has a high cost program that builds out into those areas that are rural. But there are a lot of folks out there in rural areas that are also, uh, even if you get the internet uh, to them on that last mile, they're not able to afford it. Uh, there are a significant number of low income folks in, in rural areas as well. And so making sure that I was the first to call for an affordable option if universal service and um, American taxpayer dollars in some way uh, are going to pay for that build out. So there are a number of things that I think are gonna be really important for us making sure we get where we all need. Awesome. Um, so would you say that COVID-19 has impacted your priorities at the FCC? You know, I, I, I would say, um, you know, in many ways, uh, it has changed everything. Uh, when yeah. we try to, when we talk about and think about the policy levers uh, for the economy, uh, for the workforce, for healthcare, for education, almost all of these intersect with connectivity issues, uh, telemedicine, and, and how, you know, almost all of the businesses that we see that are driving growth our economy is being powered by the internet in a lot of ways. Education, uh, you know, I don't have to tell folks, uh, you know, like like millions of Americans, I have a young learner here in my house that is um, uh, on online for her studies. And so it has changed everything. But in some ways it hasn't changed everything. And again, I come back to this issue of equity. The fact is that we've been talking about the digital divide for over 25 years. Uh, my good friend Larry Irving is the one who coined the term digital divide well over 25 years ago. So this is clearly an issue that has festered and calcified and hardened uh, over a long period. And so, you know, I've said before the pandemic has turned, you know, the digital divide into a monstrous COVID-19 divide. And you see a big um, a gulf between the haves and the have nots. And so let me share a story with you. Um, you know, a few weeks, uh, what I call the before time here, before, uh, the, before the pandemic was known and, and really hit, you know, I traveled, uh, was on a southern tour across Georgia and Alabama. I visited Montgomery, uh, the historic Selma, Alabama, and I had the opportunity to sit down uh, with the mayor uh, of, of Selma to discuss what his city needs. Uh, but, you know, I was also introduced to the leaders of a critical program there, the Selma Public Housing Authority that prioritized getting residents in, you know, uh, urban, um, um, low-income housing uh, access to free broad broadband and tablets. And so, you know, I'll never forget that I sat down with a single mother of three uh, who lived in the George Washington Carver homes there and benefited from this program. And she told me how broadband enabled her to complete her assignments to help her get an online degree program, helped her children able to finish their homework, helped keep her children safe at home instead of you know out uh, on the streets uh, trying to find Wi-Fi connection, trying to do those things. And so it was a transform, you know, it's an, an example of the transformative power uh, of, uh, of broadband. And, and that, that rolls back to my mind a number of times. You know, uh, I think it was the moment that we have here where it, what the rest of the moment, it, what the rest of the year was going to look like, and it was kind of encapsulated in that way. You know, we need to boldly advocate uh, for reliable, affordable broadband, low-income communities, Black, Latinx, tribal households, uh, they really need our attention to make sure that they are getting the connectivity that we know that they need. And so, you know, uh, I think the pandemic has exposed, obviously reminded us of our shared commonalities, healthcare, economic opportunity, education, and, and, and all of these have been pushed in myriad ways online. 
And so I've really seen, I've been heartened that, that a number of multi-stakeholder conversations and settings have gotten on the same page about the importance of prioritizing uh, equity in, in something that, again, I have championed, which is broadband uh, affordability. Well, you couldn't have said it better. And, you know, one of our founders of the Internet Innovation Alliance is the Larry Irving. Um, <laughs> he did that with Bruce Melvin. I don't know if you knew that. And yeah, well, Larry, yes, so I know that's right. Well, we follow in their footsteps, and you're absolutely right. It is our imperative that every American have access to this powerful tool that's really going to make a difference. And you you mentioned the emergency broadband benefit mm -hmm. that we are, you know, all fingers crossed will be signed shortly. And, you know, it provides a discount of up to $50 a month toward broadband service for eligible households and then $75 if you're in tribal lands. But are there other features? You know, we hear about that, but, you, you know, there are other features that must make a difference. And it's just, you know, these plans are massive. So the question becomes, you know, are there other features that you'd like to highlight so people are aware of them? Yeah, I would like to, you know, j j just one quick point. Uh, you know, the EBB has already been passed in legislation. We are setting it up, already voted on it at the FCC. It is set to get rolled out uh, by, uh, by late April within 60 days of us voting on it. The E-rate uh, is something that I am also uh, eager to, to get started. But it's a great question. There are a couple things that I want to focus, you know, your attention and, and folks' attention on with the EBB. Uh, because like I said, it really is, you know, other than Lifeline, the only program now designed to connect low-income folks. And obviously that is going to for sure lift the boats of a number of people of color, uh, a, a, a community that I feel strongly has to be focused on if we're going to get all Americans connected. Uh, and so I was glad, first of all, to see that this program was extended uh, as a program benefit to those that are struggling during the pandemic. That includes, of course, those that are unemployed or have experienced a substantial loss of income. You know, we're, we're talking about folks here. We've seen, uh, a, a, you know, a number of folks that need um, uh, food insecurity, need, have, have, have gone on, um, on SNAP. And so, you know, if you are having food insecurity, I say you're probably likely having digital insecurity as well. And so making sure that there is a way that we are are, are um, focusing on these families that are struggling right now during the pandemic. You know, second, Congress specifically targeted support for families uh, that are uh, have children participating in the free and reduced price lunch uh, and breakfast programs. And so, you know, I have long worried about these households and, and making sure that they're both learning and also getting what they need um, digitally. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, um, you know, these programs do have a lot of logistical and privacy challenges as well to try to get those students imported into the EBB. And so that's why, you know, as we were um, uh, thinking through the program, I focused on what are called the community eligible uh, provision schools. These are, if folks don't know, it's called CEP. These are uh, where a whole community sits in a high poverty area. And so the whole, you know, it allows these high poverty schools and districts to serve free breakfast and lunch uh, at no cost to, to, to the whole school. Uh, and so making sure that we approved eligibility that focused on these nearly 14, uh, nearly 14.9, 15 million uh, students attending these high poverty schools was a real focus of mine. And so, um, you know, making sure that these households got into the program, approved quickly, expedited verification was something that I pushed hard for and was something that I got. And I'm deeply proud of that. You know, and, and, and last, again, I always want to uh, bring it back to, to, to real folks. Um, you know, I met uh, just last week or, or about two weeks ago with the principal, uh, Willie Brewster, from uh, the Brenda Scott Academy in Detroit, uh, a school where over 88 percent of the students are black, 80 uh, percent of the students qualified for free or reduced price lunch. And talking with those students, uh, an assortment of middle middle schoolers that were so precocious and so smart. Uh, but 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 put their finger on the the nose of uh, uh, devices that were underperforming and a lack of connectivity. Uh, and so making sure that those are two things that this program focuses on. One student uh, uh, who I expect to ultimately become an FCC commissioner someday said, "We need a better internet." 
uh, and I could not agree more with that young lady. Uh, and so making sure that we're focusing on this, I think is gonna be, um, uh, again, a, a mission critical uh, point, and I have great expectations for this program. And the point you raised about that young woman is really great. One of your great thought leader initiatives is elevating the role of historically black colleges and universities. And yes. Been all over um, raising that flag, and people sometimes forget that you know historically black colleges play an, an, an integral role in making sure that when there's something missing in the puzzle, they're the missing piece. And so I just wanted to get your um, you know vision about how you see HBCUs as a solution to closing the digital divide. Well, you know, uh, thank you so much for, for bringing that up. I could not uh, agree more. And and uh, you know, if if we were in the room together, uh, you know, I would I we would see eye to eye on this. Uh, you know, and and uh, you know, during the pandemic, I've hosted two HBCU presidents roundtables uh, with schools across the country, uh, from uh, Delaware State to 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 Howard to Morehouse. Uh, and, and just a number of institutions that are, are, are leading. Um, you know, I, I did those because, you know, I believe we must ensure that these institutions do have, as you said, the tools that they need to continue shaping uh, the leaders of tomorrow. Uh, and it is HBCU students, faculty, alumni who continue to push uh, for, for, for justice. Um, you know, we do know that um, HBCUs are concentrated uh, in black communities. Uh, and so it, it, that pushes, uh, you know, a number of the topics that we've already talked about today, but especially black communities across the South. Uh, and they truly are anchors of their geographic regions, are anchors of their towns and cities. Uh, and so many students, notably, uh, when I talk to a number of presidents, have talked about how students have had to return home, you know, almost like a diaspora where they have had to return home but continue their studies. Uh, and so many of these students live in disproportionately unserved, underserved areas. And so they're having trouble getting connectivity that they can continue their studies. And so, you know, most pointedly, 75% of HBCU students qualify for Pell Grants, uh, which again, makes them eligible for this emergency broadband benefit. These are students that we know uh, are having connectivity uh, uh, issues and we need to make sure that they continue and can continue their studies wherever they are um, in, in, in order to, 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 to finish. Um, and so again, this is, this is, we need to focus on students, we need to focus on the communities in which these HBCUs sit uh, to make sure that they continue to be the powerhouses that we know that they are. The last thing that I would mention here briefly, uh, Kim is, you, you know, in, in a lot of ways, I have, I have also focused on what comes after uh, schools um, and once folks graduate. And that is, you know, something that I'm deeply proud of is the early career diversity initiative that I started at the FCC. Uh, and that is specifically going to HBCUs. We have a number of technical jobs at the FCC that are engineering jobs, and we have a number of uh, lawyer positions. Uh, and so making sure that uh, we are recruiting and getting the best uh, and diverse talent that we know is out there in order to make sure that we are making the best policy possible. And so making sure that we are specifically going to HBCUs, MSIs, uh, and, and recruiting from those schools, uh, as well as, you know, something that I also instituted is, you know, a lot of folks um, uh, cannot take a pure free internship. Uh, and so I've started, uh, restarted a paid internship um, um, with the FCC. Uh, and so making sure that folks can both work uh, as well as get the training because a lot of these early opportunities are the way that you get your foot in the door to make sure that your career can continue to progress in the technology and telecom space that we know is going to continue uh, to, to power our future again. If you're thinking through, uh, you know, what, what are the jobs of the future? A lot of these are focused on, um, um, you know, technology issues. 
That, that's a great point. And I, I was going to ask you that question, and I think you've kind of already answered it, so I'll, I'll make it a shorter question. I mean, essentially, you're saying that all these things lead to how broadband adoption and how it universal broadband, in fact, will lead to sort of a, a better impact on the future of work for communities of color. I mean, is that... I, I yes, that's exactly right, and and uh, you know I, I I buried the lead here uh, because yesterday I published uh, an op-ed uh, in CNN with NAACP president Derek Johnson, uh, and he and I have been in a long collaboration and and dialogue on what is the best way. Uh, he believes deeply in digital divide, as do many. Um, you know, but but focusing on this point of how you know inextricably inextricably linked, you know, economic opportunity is to digital divide, and the urgent need the you know for people of color, low income communities to have that affordable broadband. And so, you know, I would commend that piece if if folks uh, haven't otherwise seen it. Uh, you know, go to my Twitter you know, at Jeffrey Starks, at G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y-S-T-A-R-K-S. There's a link to it there. Um, uh, you know, but unemployment for black workers during the pandemic reached its peak in April and May of, of 2020. Uh, you know, nearly 16, uh, over 16 percent, nearly 3 million black folks were out of work looking for jobs. And that occurred in a number of ways for folks uh, that had, you know, obviously the unemployment numbers even broadly were, were, were staggering. Uh, you know, but but what we're hearing and what we know is that, uh, you know, the current unemployment rates for workers remains very high. For black workers, it remains at 9.9%, almost 10% uh, just this month. And so it's clear that rebuilding our economy uh, is going to require that retraining of our workforce as well. And so that means, again, making sure that folks have access to uh, that upskilling, that reskilling, uh, so that they can get connected to those jobs of the future. And so focus again on those marginal communities that we know are going to need to be connected uh, is going to be really powerful. But but there's a second element to this as well, uh, which is that, you know, when you're thinking about the future of work, uh, you know, you also have to think about entrepreneurship. And we know that our small businesses uh, have been hammered uh, throughout the pandemic. The, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter uh, is that uh, there's been a plunge in business, in small business ownership, uh, both amongst communities of color and small businesses just generally. And so there are many factors that have, of course, led to this. Again, you know, see my prior point that, that you know, the ability to, to quickly pivot uh, to a digital model has really mattered to those small businesses. Uh, and, and if you were able to do so, they flourish. But obviously, small businesses also have, you know, uh, other needs and, and, and resources uh, and so we have to make sure that, um, you know, again, communities that get better connected are going to be able to have better services and and those businesses are going to need to perform better. And so this kind of goes hand in hand that delivering services uh, is going to be critically important. And so for, for myriad reasons, for our, our economy, for our workforce, uh, you know, I could talk about telemedicine and how making sure that, you um, uh, keeping people safe during a pandemic, both our, our medical workers uh, as well as people who need medical care. That also is relying on broadband. There's just so many cross intersectional ways that making sure that uh, that all Americans are, are connected is has got to be our one A, B and C priority right now. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and I love how if you, you know, listen to this conversation from the beginning, I mean, you literally started with the children. We went through college. And now we're recognizing that all of this links to the future and the future of work. And so it, it really is, um, and, and not just work, but, you know, your health and your connection to your community, you know, your ability to get a shot. I mean, it just, it just goes on and on and on. And it's, it, you know, it's so funny. We have so many problems in the world, but this is something that could be a bridge to so many people. So I'm going to be generous and I'm going to ask um, a question from the audience. Joseph Mancini just sent us a question. Um, the FCC is looking for outreach partners for the EBB. What are the expectations of those partners? Uh, well, we are, you know, obviously it's a great question. Uh, and, and we are looking for partners uh, across the whole chain. Um, uh, and so that includes obviously, um, uh, you know, provide broadband providers who are going to sign up to participate 
um, and 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 bring uh, the internet to uh, participants in the EBB. Uh, and so I, I, you know, making sure that we actually deliver the internet is incredibly important. The other part of that equation is obviously making sure uh, that we are penetrating into our communities to make sure that they know about the program, getting folks actually signed up. You know, the fact of the matter is that we had 60 days uh, by Congress to get a $3.2 billion program set up. And so that is no easy thing, making sure that, you know, again, a lot of folks, rightfully so, you know, know about if they're having food insecurity, how to get signed up uh, for SNAP to make sure that they uh, can, can, can get food on the table. But again, if you're having digital insecurity, folks may not necessarily be aware that there is uh, a new program that is going to get connectivity to your household. Uh, and so making sure that we uh, get folks signed up has to be uh, a very second uh, mission critical element of that. But we also need, uh, we need schools, we need churches, we need organizations that are going to continue to talk to folks. Obviously, you know, I don't want to be too, too, too flippant here, but it's, it's almost a need money to make money situation here where we're talking about getting connectivity uh, to households that are unconnected in a lot of ways. But these are exactly the folks that are very hard to reach right now so much of what we are doing is powered through the internet. And so if we're trying to reach you, uh, you know, we need to find a lot of ways to work through community organizations and schools and philanthropy um, and the YMCA, YWCA, uh, you know, so, so making sure, I don't know exactly where the questioner falls on that scale, uh, on that whole spectrum, but there has to be a way as a community organizer, uh, as a provider, as a somebody who can help round, uh, help help talk to folks that may uh, be in their community that need this program. Hopefully there's a way that they can uh, fulfill themselves in that pipeline. So I'm going to ask you one last quick question and give you one minute for this one. It's from Tali Arbear and it's um, how important is E-rate as a digital divide solution compared to a benefit like EBB or subsidizing internet service providers deployments? Yeah, it's a, it, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't necessarily frame it as a comparison of the programs. You know, obviously there are four main programs that the FCC has, you know, there is, you know, the high cost program, there's the rural hospital, uh, there's E-rate and then there's Lifeline. And so I don't think there's a way to think about the programs cannibalizing each other in a certain way. Uh, and then obviously a, another major program that we have set up on a temporary basis, the 3.2 billion is, is subject uh, as of right now, as we all sit here, uh, once that the 3.2 billion is drawn down, that program is set to expire. Obviously I think it should be a long-term program. Um, and so I wouldn't, I wouldn't frame it as E-rate versus EBB. I think uh, focusing on low income folks, uh, folks that are, uh, again, um, uh, vulnerable communities of color, we know are some of the folks that absolutely need uh, the, the internet to get to, their, to get to their households. And so that's what the emergency broadband benefit is going to do. E-rate is focusing on, uh, on schools uh, and making sure that, uh, that our young learners get connected um, and, and goes through the school districts who have a critical role here. And so I don't think, I don't think it's a versus here. I think it's an all hands on deck. All hands. I was just thinking that when you said it. <laughs> okay. So now we get to my favorite part and the favorite part, I think of the commissioners I've done in the past. This is the lightning round. This is where you tell us what Let's you do it. Pick. All right. Favorite device, phone or tablet? Uh, phone, uh, uh, definitely phone. It, it, it you know, it, it does so much, uh, both, both I'm on my phone a lot, uh, uh, doing work now these days, uh, you know, but obviously in my personal capacity, I, I you know, I, I love to be in the moment with my family, with my kids, but I also am somebody who will snap that quick pick. Uh, and so for, for, for myriad ways, uh, you know, I think phone is phone is definitely ahead of my tablet in that way. Supercomputer in your hands. Okay, favorite future <laughs> technology: self-driving cars or cars that fly. Wow, uh, I would have to say uh, I would have to say self-driving car. 
uh, you know, but b- both are both are going to play uh, a role in my future. I have no doubt that one of your one of your members could disabuse me. You know, a, a car that flies seems like two deviations away from what I know. Uh, a self-driving car, I get that. That seems real to me. I know it's it's on its way. Uh, and, and so I, I, I that one that one seems more uh, is is more locked in my mind as like a something I get. Great. Okay. Last one. Favorite superhero: Black Panther, Luke Cage, or Batman? <laughs> I gotta go. This and this has been the easiest question of the day. Uh, I gotta go with Black Panther, uh, uh, h- hands down. Um, and and uh, you know, I thought it was a tremendous movie, um, a tremendous impact. Um, you know, even beyond just just the movie, I'm a huge fan, of course, of of the late Chadwick Boseman, uh, and and I think I think that role, I think his um, body of work will, will will live on for 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 generations, and 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 in many ways, he was a superhero on and off the screen, uh, and so there's no there's no that like I said, that was the easiest question. Uh, there's no doubt, Black Panther. So right, and of course, he's a technology superhero, so that's perfect for you. There you go. Well, there you have it, everybody. Thank you so much, Commissioner Starch, for making time for us today. It was a great chat. I look forward to chatting with you in the future. This has been amazing. Um, this will be taped, and we'll have it up on our website, on the Internet uh, Internet Innovation Alliance website, IIA.org. So welcome. Thank you. Great time. Appreciate Thank you. Thank you. Bye now, everyone. Be safe. Be well. Thank you.